So if you recall, what we talked about last class was services. We talked about bound services. We talked about started services. We talked about the differences between bound services and started services. We talked about how services compare and contrast with activities, and so on and so forth. So that was kind of the context. And one of the things we mentioned while we were discussing services and activities is the fact that they can often run in different processes. It's very easy in Android to create a process that runs the service by just fiddling with a configuration file setting. And so as a result, one of the things you have to worry about is how do the services and the activities talk to each other if they're in a different address space? Or more generally, how do they talk to each other even if they're in the same address space, but you want to give the opportunity to have address space separation in the future if you so choose to, to decide to do that. So what we're going to do in this section, and then we're going to continue it with a little bit more detail in the next one, is we're going to start talking about the ways in which you can communicate between activities and services. And typically what this involves is some kind of request from the activity to the service, and we'll see there are various ways to do that. And there's typically some kind of response that goes back from this, and there's a whole bunch of patterns that are used to mediate those connections and explain how the Android implementations work and so on and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about the, the download application. So to make this discussion concrete and also to help you further planning with assignment number four, I'll be talking about a variant of the download application, not exactly like the one you're doing, but it's along the same lines. And here's the implementation there. Whoops, you can uh, go ahead and fix that. It shouldn't happen. All right. Do this. There you go. So here's where you can download the implementation of this stuff if you want to see it. Again, it's not the same as yours, but wouldn't help, wouldn't hurt to look at the code to see what it does. So basically, the way this works is you've got a download activity, which is running on the machine. When someone wants to download the image, that goes ahead and starts a background service if it's not already running, and it goes ahead and then lets the service retrieve the image and store it in a file on the file system of the device. And of course, in order to do this, it has to talk across the network and it uses sockets, which is why you have to give the internet permission in the Android manifest file so it's able to access the network. And then when it's all done, the result comes back in the form of a path to the image file that was downloaded. That shows back up at the activity and then the activity goes ahead and displays it. So let's talk about the way in which this can take place. And of course, there's lots and lots and lots of different ways we can implement this, and we'll just talk about a few of them here. So the first set of things we're going to talk about is how do you communicate from activities to services? And that's one direction, and that's usually what you need to do to kick things off. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. So the mechanisms that you decide to select, given a range of alternatives, based, are based on a number of things, like are you going to use a started service? Are you going to use a bound service? Do you want to pass messages explicitly, you want to make method calls. These are the kinds of decision points that exist in the design space that help you make a choice about which mechanism to choose. And we'll talk about all those things and you'll see lots of examples. And best of all, you get a chance to program all that stuff by the time the class is done. So the easiest way to get something passed from an activity to a service is to pass it as an intent and to make the activity be a started service. And we've seen examples of that, the music player application that we used was one example of that kind of thing, where you started up the music service and then you would basically uh, pass along with the intent that was used to start the service the URL for the song you wanted to download and play. And uh, you'll see lots of different variations on that as we talk about this. Keep in mind that with the music intent or the music player application, the service was pretty simple, right? It didn't communicate back from the service to the activity. It didn't um, uh, have all kinds of complicated concurrency implementation because it used the, the media player asynchronous features to do that and so on and so forth. Your service that you're implementing for this uh, assignment four has to do more stuff. So you'll, you'll do a more involved implementation. So the easiest way to communicate is to send the intent and you can pass extras uh, to the intent that's used to start the service. And then you can, so that's one way to do it. And then another way to do it is to bind to a bound service via the bind service call. And we'll see examples of that. So you can b ex explicitly bind to the various things. And uh, we'll talk more about that. We talked about that earlier. 
once you've bound to a bound service by bind service, then you get back a, uh, a reference, a channel, if you will, that you can use to explicitly communicate to the service. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this. So one way to do it is to call send on a reference to a messenger that would be implemented by the service. And we'll take a more detailed look at that in a minute. And that's actually similar to what you'll be doing. The other thing to do, and when you do this, what happens is that a messenger is used to encapsulate a handler that's implemented within the service. And what's interesting about this is that this is basically taking the hammer framework mechanisms we talked about before, where you've got these handlers and you send messages and the messages show up via handle message calls on a handler and so on. All those kinds of things that we talked about before when we talked about concurrency in Android, those were all limited within the address space of one process. So what messengers are going to allow us to do is extend the same model of passing messages, except now we can talk between processes, which gives us more flexibility, which of course is what we'll be using in uh, your next assignment. Okay, so the other approach, which we're not going to cover for assignment four, but we'll cover probably for assignment 5b is to use method calls and invoke methods and have method calls be used to transmit information back and forth. And this uses so-called stubs that are generated by a special compiler that reads interfaces and generates out ways of communicating between address spaces. It's pretty cool. So we'll talk more about that when the time comes. And you can implement these methods to do all kinds of interesting things. You can have concurrency and um, other features that we'll talk about later when we get to that part. That'll probably be a couple weeks after we get back from break. Okay, so let's start first about how you communicate. Or, so that's basically how you communicate from activities to services. And the ways to do that, as you can see here, is you can use an intent with a started service, or you can use a bound service and then either use messengers explicitly in order to pass messages, which is what you're doing in assignment four, or you can go ahead and do AIDL calls, uh, which make method calls that go between the address spaces. The other way of thinking about communication is from the service back to the activity. And that's obviously the, the other side of the coin, right? This is sort of two sides of the same coin, going from the activity to the service and then from the service back to the activity. So let's talk about different ways to do that. So this is the reply channel to get back from a service to an activity. Uh, once again, there are different ways to do it. Typically, the activity Initiating the communication, in some sense, is, is what's going to um, ensure this all works properly. The, the activity has to be a partner in this. The service cannot unilaterally decide these things. It has to be done as an, as an agreement, as a protocol, between the activity and the service it talks to. And so knowing how to balance those things is important as far as how your design works. So one approach is to use a messenger that's passed from the activity to the service in order for the service to send a message back to the activity that initiated the communication in the first place. So that's the approach you're going to use in assignment number four. And this approach works for um, started services. So you have a started service, you have the service pass a messenger with the intent, the receiving service gets that intent, pulls the messenger out of it, and then after it does its thing, whatever its thing may be, it can then go ahead and send the result back to the activity that started things. And we'll talk about that a lot because that's kind of what you're going to be doing. So the activity creates a messenger. Um, hold on. It doesn't create a messenger service. Well, I'll, I'm just going to leave that. Um, it creates a messenger and it passes it to the service. And then the service uses this messenger to send reply messages back to the handler on the activity. And we'll see when we get into the code in a little bit more detail, there's a multi-step process that's used to make this work. So that's one approach, message passing. The other approach is to use this Android interface definition language, or AIDL, in order to be able to pass methods back and forth or make method calls. And in that particular case, when you make a method call to the service, the implementation of that method on the service will do whatever it needs to do in the implementation of the method, and then it simply uses its return values and or its out parameters to get results back from the service to the activity. Yes, sir? Uh, 
messages? Are those messages the same as the message that you talked about? Ah, great question. So if you would think about what we talked about when we talked about the Hammer framework and Android concurrency, we talked about the, the user interface thread or the UI thread, and it has a message, a message queue, and all the stuff that takes place on background threads that are spawned either by users or by the async task thread pools, et cetera. When those guys are done with their background processing, they go ahead and they post messages or send messages. They get back to the message queue that's managed by the UI thread. We, we talked about all that kind of stuff, right? That's what is done with the concurrency framework. And the question is, how does all that stuff relate to what we're talking about here? And so as we see when we look at the implementation, some of the same mechanisms can in fact be used with the communication that we're talking about here. Um, the difference being that with this stuff, we can go, we can either use the same message queue that was used before, which is fine, or we can create other threads, or the system will create other threads for us, and then communication can take place between those things as well. So with the Hammer framework, we talked about the results are typically always coming back to the UI thread. With some of the things we're going to talk about later, you can have other threads that are you either create or the system creates for you, and communication can take place between them. And it might end up coming back to the UI thread if that's what you needed to do. But there's other scenarios where you don't have it interact with the UI thread at all. So communication could take place between threads that are not the UI thread in the, U, in the uh, activity to threads, of course, that are not the UI thread in a service. And that communication can take place. And only if you need to display the results would you then have to have the thread on the activity that's a background thread talk back to the UI thread by the conventional means. So you see that I guess the short answer to your question is um, they might be the same or they could be different depending on how you configure things. Tristan, did you have a question? I expect you'll answer it in the next like 10 minutes, but you don't know, want to ask no, go, go ahead. Uh, ask it. Um, Right, so a messenger, a messenger is like uh, a special envoy who has powers that allow the messenger to be given to something else, like a service, or from a service to an activity. You'll see it goes both ways. And the messenger has the special powers of being a proxy that can actually send messages across address spaces. As you'll see in momentarily as we get a little further, handlers are not that powerful. Handlers do not have that special ability, but messengers do. So when do they get destroyed? Is it whenever the, uh, the service or activity that, that's spawned that created, created them? Is when they're, whenever they're no longer referenced. They're garbage collected like everything else in Java. Yes, because. So what's the difference between a mess message, uh, messenger and a intent? Ah, great question. So intents are, in some sense, more fundamental because intents are used to start up <coughs> activities, services, and also broadcast receivers, which we haven't talked about much yet. But those are things that they can be launched, right? So they're very fundamentally built into the fabric of Android, and that's how it does all of its component matching and resolution and activation and all that kind of good stuff. And intents can also contain some information, right? You can, you can have extras that are passed with an intent that are things like strings or integers or arrays and so on. So you can also bundle information with an intent, but an intent's main purpose is to launch a component. Messengers are something like a subset of an intent. And, and the other thing about an intent is uh, an intent is, a, is sort of a passive data structure. Stuff comes with it, but once you have an intent, you really can't get back to the guy who sent you the intent. right? Messengers, in contrast, don't have the ability to start things up. They're not fundamental the way that intents are. You can't use them to launch things. However, messengers, when you pass them around, just like you pass around intents, when you receive a, a messenger, you can make a send call and pass a message back to the one who sent you the messenger in the first place. So they're basically objects that can be used to communicate across address spaces. Whereas an intent doesn't allow you to communicate across an address space, although it does allow you to deliver information from one address space to another. But it's, it's, um, the use cases are slightly simpler. Wynn? Uh, yeah. how, how do messengers uh, fit into the components of Android that we discussed? So good question. So remember, the, the components in Android are activities, services, broadcast receivers, and content providers. And intents are largely the glue that launches those things and gets them to work together in very flexible ways. 
Messengers allow communication to take place between activities and services. So they're more of a, communi they're more of a communication mechanism, whereas intents can be used for communication, but they're really about launching and gluing, and messengers are about communicating, or they're a vehicle for communicating. <coughs> Great questions. Okay, so as we'll get a little bit later, I'm not going to dwell on this right now because we're going to come back to it, but there's a bunch of different ways to communicate with this AIDL mechanism, and you can have one-way calls or you can have two-way calls. And one-way calls, as the name implies, just go one way and there's no necessary return value or return semantics associated with them, whereas two-way calls allow conversations to take place between clients and servers. And we'll talk about those kinds of things. And you can use the return value or the out parameters of two-way method calls to implicitly reply back to whoever sent the message in the first place or made the method call in the first place. Again, you'll get more experience with that a little bit later in the course. At first glance, these two-way calls seem really cool because it allows you to program as if you were invoking a regular two-way function call or two-way method call on an object. It looks very much like making a, a normal object method, uh, method call on an object in the same address space. And that's cool at first glance, right? Because it looks like your program doesn't have to be changed. The downside occurs when something goes wrong, when whoever is called hangs for a long period of time. That can have a very detrimental effect on the way the system is able to respond. So we'll see that there's patterns of programming with AIDL that involves multiple method calls using one-way calls. And we'll talk about that later.